Oh, we're good to go. Anybody want to know about my background or anything? Sure. Why you decided to bring me to this class? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. This is <laughs> Renzer Bell. I, I'll go to the book. Okay, okay. All right, fair enough. Uh, my name is Renzer Bell. I uh, was actually born and raised in Jacksonville. Uh, at some point, I realized that uh, there were some limitations in Jacksonville when I was growing up. So I decided that uh, when I got to the point that I had some credentials, I would go somewhere else and try to develop a career on my trade, so to speak. So after uh, graduating with a bachelor's, I took a job with the uh, International Division of Bank of America. And I guess you could say I went through a brief training program um, that was they tend gentle to Pace University in New York to use some of their staffing. And uh, I also went through some training in London. And my first posting with uh, the bank was Seoul, Korea. This was about 1985, thereabouts. And this particular segment of the international marketing class is pretty poignant to me because as somebody essentially fresh out of college, I was living on the economy, spending Korean yuan. Know, which is current foreign currency to me. And just to give you an idea, when I went to, when I was going through training and probably when I initially arrived in Seoul, I'm not going to say the yuan because that's not as relevant for you probably, but the yen, we think the yen was trading in 1985, 1986 to the dollar. Right about now it's about what, 80 something? Yen to the dollar? In 1985-86, well, yeah, 85, the yen was trading between 360 and 380 yen to the dollar. And uh, if you look at the presentation, you wonder why I included so much information about uh, currency shocks or exogenous events and the like. I started my career off with one. Um, in 1985, and we'll get to it in the presentation, there was an event called the Plaza Accord. I think it was October, November of 1985. Prior to the Plaza Accord, it's kind of similar to today. There was a lot of saber rattling between United States congressmen, uh, Japanese trade, dele trade delegates, because at the time, Japan had the second largest economy in the world based on GDP. And so congressmen, I can remember having, uh, you know what boom boxes? I can remember boom boxes being on the Capitol's lawn, and congressmen would make these speeches, you know, they had a little press, it's all a show, really, right? So they make a speech, and they have a sledgehammer, and they go and hit the boom box, boom! Essentially threatening Japan that if you don't do something, we're gonna put what? Tariffs on your products. You've heard that lately, right? So the Japanese and all the European allies of the United States, they got together and said, okay, we need to do something about this. So at the time, this predates the Euro. So Germany still had the mark. France had the French franc, et cetera, et cetera. Those guilders, et cetera, et cetera, all across continental Europe. So they come up with what was called the Plaza Accord. The Plaza Accord was a collective effort by some of the larger economies to move the yen to a higher level. And it was successful. And uh, by 1986, Plaza Court again was October, November of 1985. You can check my dates, but I know it was 1985. By 1986, definitely by 87, this was, what do you think the yen was traded to the dollar? Want to try? <coughs> the yen to the dollar by 87, but probably by 86, was trading between 165 and 185 to the dollar. So the value of the yen, since it's ported yen to the dollar, had doubled. And so there were consequences for that, which we'll get to later. So, and the clicker is pretty straightforward, sir. Yeah, just hit the button which way you want it to go. <laughs> There's two little arrows, you can play around with anything. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at it this way, right? The yeah, you got it. You got it. Now, some of you might ask why I put this on the screen. I mean, screen. Put, this, put this in as a screen. And the reason I put this in as a screen is because, uh, let me back up. Um, I come to you this morning in the spirit or the ethos of my presentation is uh, derived from an Arabic phrase, which is Ijaq al riwayah which means, translated, the right to teach upon the, the right to teach upon the authority of another. And so the other is uh, Dr. Hall. And the reason that's important is because it's, I believe it's very, very important that if you decide to take on the mantle of trying to bring, some, bring a message, bring information, bring as much as you can and you be as accurate as you possibly can. So if you see a lot on the presentation, uh, you might take this with you through life. It might help you somewhere. Uh, I have books I have from 1985 uh, that I still refer to today. So in the spirit of that, I want you to be think. I want you to be lifetime learners. Just because you got a bachelor's, don't stop learning. And I got a bachelor's, I realized, wow, I don't know anything. But it didn't. But I had some capacities. But I didn't really know anything. And I guess I've proven myself I could achieve uh, following a course of study and obtaining a degree. But I was scared to death because I realized I didn't know much. And then the more I traveled and the more I saw, I went, wow, you really don't know much. And here's an example. This is what's called the gall peters rejection map. Can you see this? Now, why this is significant is because this is a much more accurate depiction of the world's land masses in terms of scale than the one I grew up on, and maybe the one you see now, which is the next one. Now, you see the, the green is the overlay of the gall peters projection compared to the conventional maps that are provided, that you provide. Now you can see that some of the some of the land masses are depicted in the uh, more conventional map of the world as being larger than they actually are, according to Carl Peters. So I'm showing you this so you can become curious. If you're not already curious. Try to figure out what else is out there that might have been projected, might have been. Uh, provided to you in a slightly distorted manner, or maybe you didn't get all the facts. Because, you know, you're coming up in the internet age, and there's things all over the place that you can learn that I didn't have access to. You know, you can access libraries in other parts of the world, in theory, because you can access the internet, or at least access the title. So that's just one example of how, since we're talking about international trade, international looks a lot different than, than what you've been told. You can see South America seems to be bigger, Africa is significantly larger, et cetera, et cetera, in, a, in our actual depiction of what the land masses look like. Australia is a little bit bigger as well. So, international trade, international market. When we start talking about, uh, when we get into the part that talks about world reserve currency, again, this might be overkill, but I don't want you to think that the system that really rich sort of going to be covering, starts with the Renaissance period, that there was not a system before that. So the pattern for international trade that we have today is really patterned after the Phoenicians. Now the Phoenicians are, Phoenician is a corruption of a Greek phrase referring to purple, or a reddish purple color. And why is that significant to them? Because one of the products that they marketed was a purple dye. And they inhabited the coastlines of uh, country, uh, cities like they, they were actually the progenitors of the, of the Greek city-states. They had city-states along the coast of what's now Lebanon. So they had Biblos, they had Tyre, they had Sidon, and other city-states. They also had Carthage, which is in modern-day Tunisia and North Africa, and they had a, uh, another trading outpost in, I think this was now modern-day Yemen, that was referred to as Arabia Felix, rather than saying Spanish Felix spelling of the transliteration of the sound. So it's significant because they built warehouses. They engaged in some level of barter. Their currency was gold. When people didn't have gold to trade, they traded goods for goods. And uh, they built ports along 
the places that I'm talking about. They have a port in Carthage, in North Africa. They have, a port, they have ports along uh, what's now modern day Lebanon. And they traded all over the Mediterranean. They traded as far west as the west coast of Africa, documented in the Senegal, and even further perhaps. And to give you a time period, uh, Phoenician trading started probably somewhere between uh, 3,000 to 4,500 BCE. So the pattern has not changed a lot. You may have heard of one famous Phoenician that referred to him as Hannibal. He was a general in the Second Punic War. I think that was in the third century BCE. Uh, but I just want to let you know that some of these things, uh, nothing's new under the sun. Uh, very, very few people come up with something that nobody else has ever done before. Most times people just take something and they tweak it. So, so here's what we want to cover. Here's what we want to cover. To talk about exchange rates, we need to talk about the system of exchange rates. And the system of exchange rates is, is designed around uh, the concept of a world reserve currency. Uh, the use of the world reserve currency is to be a medium uh, of exchange that people can agree on. Like I said, historically it was gold, or alternatively silver. Uh, even in some civilizations, copper. So, I just gave you, if you look at the presentation, there's a mention of some that predate the Renaissance. So I tried to pick you up from just below or corresponding with the Phoenician period, the things like the silver drachma, gold areas coins, uh, which are Roman, uh, gold solidus. <coughs> then by the time you get to the seventh century of Arabian dinar, so on and so forth. So the, the purpose of providing this to you is not to have you remember an exhaustive list of coins or currencies that are no longer in use. Just to give you a framework to understand that things have changed. And things are probably going to change again. So if you go forward. And so in the quote unquote post dark age of Europe, and are you familiar with the dark age of Europe? That's after the Roman Empire fell. Uh, and uh, you had some other currencies that became world reserve currencies. Torino was primarily regional, primarily the Mediterranean region, and the Portuguese real, and then the biggest of all, and probably the most, uh, one of the most longevity was the Spanish silver real. This one is very important because in the early days of commodities and stock trading, stocks and even bonds used to trade in fractions of eights. And the reason that is, it goes back to the history of the Spanish silver real in reference to pieces of eight. So before decimalization, uh, prices of security were quoted in fractions, dollars and fractions of dollars. So as you go through, you see Dutch Gilda, French Frank, and all of the time periods are listed here just for your reference. And I hope if this is interesting or something you actually encounter in your careers, you can use this as a guide uh, to do more research and to gain uh, a mastery of this. So now we want to bring you to, after we look at these, you can see all the different currencies. As we get to a more modern era, you can see the United Kingdom, the British pound, was a world reserve currency for a considerable amount of time, uh, roughly just over 100 years. Now, the United States dollar became a world reserve currency officially in 1944 in Bretton Woods Conference. But it was de facto world reserve currency just after World War I. Um, we live now in a world that's essentially post Bretton Woods, though some of the Bretton Woods framework still remains. So the Bretton Woods Conference, you can see how we proceeded uh, from there to try to improve on a system that was fractured. 
So you have the Bretton Woods, US dollar made official, where was their currency? The currency value of most currencies were expressed in US dollar terms. The exchange rates were fixed. That's a lot different than now. Today, the exchange rates generally float. You have a few countries that try to fix their rate, but it's really difficult because uh, market forces are generally larger than any uh, single country's uh, reserves. So countries pledged to act collectively to maintain the fixed rates. Good luck with that. It didn't work. The dollar's pegged to gold and convertible to gold. This is very important. You've had many crises that have ensued since Bretton Woods, or prior to Bretton Woods, actually, based upon the concept that you're going to have the dollar or any currency converted into gold. And you'll see why this shortly. Also out of Bretton Woods, we get the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. And they were designed allegedly to stabilize imbalances in the international currency regimes. So to see, we get further into this, see the demise of the Bretton Woods Agreement. It didn't work. There were flaws. And this has been the case with most systems. Uh, world reserve currencies, or the country uh, that's host to the world reserve currency, has generally had problems, mainly because in order to essentially provide the liquidity required for the system, the host country has to run what's termed balance of payments deficits. So in other words, they have to import more than they export. Otherwise, the system does not have sufficient amount of the world reserve currency in circulation for world trade to be conducted. That's why the United States, though we complain about it, runs balance of payments deficits. Uh, it's a complaint. I don't know if the politicians are aware of it, but it's very hard to avoid when your currency is the world reserve currency because there's going to be demand for it. And uh, you've, essentially, you've essentially agreed to make your currency available in significant enough quantities that people can trade. Um, so these are issues that are with us today as well. Another problem with the Bretton Woods system was that you had countries who were in balance of payments deficits. Uh, some of them developing, some of them in Southern Europe and different places, who bore the brunt of the adjustment mechanism. And the adjustment mechanism almost always meant that the deficit countries had to devalue their currency. When you devalue your currency, what you're essentially doing is you are importing inflation. Because it takes more of your currency when you devalue it to buy incoming goods, right, from other places. So it's a vicious cycle. So eventually you're going to have problems. And the problems started occurring very early, and they were persistent. As you can see, the system essentially uh, started to collapse on its own weight. Um, but we'll get to that more when we get into exogenous shocks to the system. But officially, in 1971, the uh, United States ended the conversion of the US dollar to gold. Something that's noteworthy is that the price of gold was fixed in terms of its conversion rate to the United States dollar for about 100 years. So from the 1800s until, I believe, 1933, the, value, the conversion value of the US dollar to gold was $25.67. Now, as many of you know, you've taken some business classes, you bought things, you have uh, hobbies, things you collect. It's very difficult to keep the, keep the conversion price or the price of something fixed for over 100 years. And eventually, as you can see in 1971, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt raised the price, converted the price to $35 in around 1933. Amazingly, it was only raised another $3 in 1971. Uh, but that was just the fixed price. Remember, the conversion was gone. They're just saying that's what it's worth. So a troy ounce of gold is worth $38, according to the United States and the Federal Reserve in 1975. But you couldn't convert any dollars to that. Um, by 1973, they bumped to $42. And then in 1976, they did not even quote a dollar fixed rate uh, to gold. So an exchange rate is simply you want to know what an exchange rate is, you don't already know, it's simply the rate at which you will convert any two commodities, 
In this case, we're talking about currencies. One of the things you know about rates is that there is never just one price in the marketplace. If you call a dealer, a bank, or, or someone else that's uh, uh, making a market in foreign exchange, like a travel agent, Thomas Cook, or I think Thomas Cook, I'm busy sending you some money down, but people that exchange money, American Express, there's two prices, there's a bid and an offer. Uh, and I say that because I was a market maker in options. I have a, when someone asks me for a quote, my quote would be five bid and nine. Five is what I'll pay, nine is what I'll sell it for. That's an important aspect of this because the, the bid off the spread is always going to be against the person seeking to do, seeking to trade on someone else's market. So just to go briefly through it, there's, there's a few different conventional commercial exchange uh, transactions. You have spot rates, that essentially means two business day settlement. Spot next, essentially a rollover, so instead of two business day settlement, we'll sell it in three. Uh, Tom X is essentially a swap. You roll over your existing position. So today, I'll buy yours. Tomorrow, you'll buy it back. And we'll end up in two business days in the same position we were today. Then there's uh, forward rates. That's Tom X, by the way. Uh, forward rates. Forward rates are essentially tailored. If you were the CFO of a company and you have foreign exchange exposure, you go to a bank, a dealer, investor bank, and say, okay, I'm expecting uh, so many yen in payment in 65 days. And, and, a, and, a, and a dealer could fix you, could agree with you, or, or show you his, his market for the forward, the 65 day value of the yen versus the dollar. We'll get to that later showing that's one of the hedging mechanisms you can use to, to uh, limit the foreign exchange exposure. Um, so one of the things I want to get to today is, and be very specific on, is that interest rates and exchange rates are inextricably, inextricably linked. You can't separate them really. And the reason I say that is because you look at the, on the forward rate, the swap rate. What, you, uh, what the dealer is going to actually quote you is a swap rate. And the swap rate is based upon the net accessible interest differential between the two currencies. So he figures out what he'll sell or buy the yen for 65 days from you or sell to you based upon what approximate 65 day deposit rate 65 day uh, borrowing rates for those currencies will be in the uh, professional interest rate market. We'll get to that more later. The other uh, thing I like to talk about with rates is what's commonly referred to as currency cross rates. And all the cross rate means is generally currency are quoted against the dollar. Uh, so you, before you had the euro, you had Deutsche Marks against the dollar. You had pound sterling against the dollar, you had French francs against the dollar. So a cross, rate, a cross rate would be German mark against French franc. It's nothing uh, esoteric or exotic. Those trades, like any other quote, would be for, uh, forward, spot, convex, spot next, um, with a bid off or spread. Another important characteristic of the uh, international monetary system as it applies to rates are corresponding correspondent banking relationships. And so as trade expanded, banks expanded with their commercial customers. So you have what's called Nostro accounts. Nostro account to me, if I'm a bank, and myself and this gentleman are sitting up, what's your name, sir? Brian. Brian. Brian and I, we're sitting on a currency, on a money market or currency desk, right? So as we discuss our transactions, uh, we tell our back office something pertaining to Nostro accounts. That's essentially our accounts with other with our correspondence. And it's our accounts with our correspondence we use to do the exchange. So let's say it's euro versus dollar. We have a euro account. Let's say maybe it's with our branch in Frankfurt. We give them instructions to transfer so many euros to pick a bank, Wells Fargo. And Wells Fargo would, uh, in turn, do the same thing with their nostril account and it would transfer funds to us. 
Foster accounts are just the opposite. It's your accounts with us. That's all it means. So our counterparty's accounts with us is what the Foster accounts mean. Now we go to factors which move exchange rates. Nominal supply and demand. What I mean by that is just the supply and demand for the currency on a given day um, over a given two or three days. Technical analysis driven trades. What that means would be there's a body of uh, art slash science which looks at things like volume, uh, open interest in the, in the business, the futures contract, um, chart patterns, rates of change of a commodity. In other words, how fast did it move from Tuesday to Thursday? Suppose it moved uh, the equivalent of the currency term, uh, put it in oil terms, so I can do it quickly. Oil is trading, what's texting the media is probably trading about $53. Okay, if it moves $3 in two business days, and it's normally been taking two weeks to move three dollars. Technicians look at that and say, wow, something's going on here. So there's some momentum. There's some, let's say three dollars higher. So the technicians will look at that and say there's some momentum here based upon what they've learned and the way they analyze the data to say that triggers me to participate in the market. I need to be a buyer because the market is probably going to substantially same thing with lower moves. So technical analysis involves uh, doing analysis of volume, um, charts, uh, moving averages, exponential moving average, simple moving average, weighted moving average, uh, moving at MACD, which is moving average, convergence, divergence. So you would have a 50-day versus a 200-day, and the 50-day crosses the 200-day, that's going to be bullish if it goes, crosses above. If it crosses below, that signals short-term weakness. So those are what those types of analysis and thoughts impact commodity prices and particularly exchange rates as well. Uh, inflation expectation, very big. Uh, a country with high inflation expectations would generally have a currency that's going to be devalued or expected to be devalued. So that's a part of what's called fundamental analysis, looking at the fundamental aspects of a country's economy and judging from that where you think the currency will go. So people make trades based upon that kind of analysis as well. Interest rate differentials, quick money. Um, if you can seize upon the opportunity to capture interest rate differential, there are hedge funds and banks and others, all kind of investors that will jump on and say they'll go to the hot money currency. The currency with interest rate differential is favorable. They'll invest there, which will involve them obviously selling another currency. Um, how many people are familiar with the current account? We'll get to that. But that's another form of fundamental analysis. The current account is essentially looking at the, the trade profile of the country. We have a chart for that. Then you have um, central bank intervention. This is huge. As we'll see later, as you go through the presentation, uh, the crash of 1929 um, perhaps did not have to lead to a depression that lasted 10 years or so. What was going on at the time was after the crash or, uh, or around the time of the crash and thereafter, you had you still had the ability to convert dollars into gold. So what did the Fed do? The Federal Reserve started raising interest rates. And they were raising interest rates to defend, not to defend the currency, they, were, they raised interest rates to defend the gold supply because the United States did not have enough gold to satisfy the potential redemption of the dollars for gold. So they started to raise interest rates. So you raise interest rates into a recession and it just got worse. Um, but central banks play a huge role in the economies of the world particularly in the West. Um, and they have, they have a, a toolbox that, to my mind, consists of about six tools. One is they can communicate their desires. They can get a, uh, the, the chairman of the Federal Reserve can have a speech. He can determine that, uh, well, we think the market is, uh, as uh, Alan Greenspan famously said, he used the term irrational exuberance. 
signaling that the stock market he thought was a little bit frothy. Maybe it was getting a little ahead of itself. People in the marketplace take note. That could impact the actions of people like Brian, right? You might say, wow, who? the Fed is saying that. I mean, what do you do? You call my, I mean, let me call the trading firm. I need to take some of these positions off because I'm a little concerned. That is a tool of the Federal Reserve. Another tool would be reserve requirement. Are we aware of what that is? Okay, well, banks have reserve requirements. So if you go down to the bank and you open up an account, to me, to me, it goes down to the bank, opens up an account, hundred thousand dollar deposit, right? Banks have a requirement to keep a certain amount of that as reserves before they make a loan. It's probably in the, in the region of eight to eleven percent. So do the math. Let's say nine percent, right? What's nine percent of one hundred thousand dollars? Nine thousand dollars. Nine thousand dollars. You say nine percent of one hundred thousand. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, so 9000 <laughs> 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 9, has to be kept as a reserve, Wait a which means they can lend, uh, what's the remaining? 91000 right? So we have what's called a fractional reserve banking system. So just give you an idea of how this goes, and you can do the iteration one day yourself. Uh, Henry Ford once said that if the American public actually knew uh, how our monetary system worked, there'd be a revolution in the morning. Don't, don't start a revolution in the morning. So this should use that example, $91,000, right? So $91,000 can be lent. Okay? Now what's 9% of $91,000? You see how this works? So in essence, when a bank gives you a loan, say, suppose Brian gets a loan for $91,000 from the bank. Right? When they give you a loan, they create a loan account for you. That's separate from your checking and all other accounts you have. So it's a loan account. And that allows you to draw, to, to draw down on the loan. But let's say you meet a very beautiful young lady walking down the uh, sidewalk one day from Argentina. You see, y'all always want to learn the tango. I'm going, after, after this semester, Instead of pursuing your business, you're going to take a month up and go to Argentina with you. The bank is not just going to sit there and let that money sit. They're going to make a loan on that money. They're going to make a loan on your loan. <coughs> I mean, you understand what I'm saying? So, so in other words, this keeps going almost like a, uh, like a binomial tree. They're using calculus, right? So they'll just keep lending. So if you can do the calculation, figure out how many times this, this uh, $100,000 could be loaned. So each time they create a loan, there's a loan account, and if the money's sitting, uh, you, could be, you could be earning interest on your money in your loan account by the way behind it. But they're not going to let it sit and just pay interest. They're going to try to find a way to, to, to fund another loan with that. So you just keep going. So the Fed has the right, has the ability and the mandate to be able to change the reserve requirement. So let's think about this. If we raise the reserve requirement from 9% to 11%, what does that do to the money, potential money supply? Is it increase it or decrease it? Pardon? Decrease. Right. Decrease. Because you have less loanable funds now because more has to be held in reserve. This is something that the Chinese Central Bank has done several times. They lowered, they've done something, I really can't remember the Fed doing this, but they've lowered their reserve requirement two or three times over the last five years. The, the uh, People's Bank of China, I think it's called. So that's, that's another tool of a central bank, reserve account, discount rate. Discount rate means I've got paper, bonds, uh, whatever, uh, bills of trade, uh, what do you call these? Uh, and so if a bank has bills of trade, uh, or let's say letters of credit, documentary credits, and uh, they can go to the Fed and discount. So in other words, the Fed will give you cash against your bills at a given rate. Now, if they lower that rate, that encourages more people to, liquid, to, to liquefy uh, paper, That's essentially documentary credits and other forms of paper assets. They can raise the discount rate, and that discourages people from doing that. So again, this is a tool of either increasing or decreasing the money supply. The other one would be the Fed can mandate changes to the composition of banks' balance sheets. 
So the Fed can say, um, let's get somebody else. Can we talk to two people? Anybody else? Good answer? Lucas. Lucas. Lucas is around the back. And the Fed mandates, okay, we want you to have more short-term securities as opposed to, because banks hold a lot of securities, uh, primarily bonds, well, almost all, all bonds, and short-dated papers in their portfolio to provide liquidity in case, because this is one thing you didn't know about banking, because I gave you that example. What did you learn about banking? Maybe you already knew it. The bank never has your money there at the ready. You understand that, right? That's why you have a central bank. So if somebody runs down that bank, they don't have enough money, they call another bank within the system, and they get liquidity. They, they say, okay, I got this that I can use as collateral. Uh, I need $13 million. Fine. They go directly to the Fed, because bank because banks who have excess reserves can park those at the Fed and, more, and receive interest. So, uh, if, if the Fed mandates it, Lucas, you might have to sell longer term bonds and buy shorter term paper because the Fed said they want the confidence of banks balances to change. Again, that impacts liquidity, it impacts patterns in, in, the, in, the, in the interest rate market. And then there's something called open market operations. That's when the, when the central bank actually goes into the market and it buys and sells securities. It buys bonds, it buys notes, it buys bills, it buys any number of things. I think we saw here with the quantitative easing you saw in, in uh, the European Central Bank and the Federal Reserve, I think they even bought some government agency paper, maybe even mortgage-backed securities. So when the Fed goes in and buys those securities, what does that do to the money supply? Depletes it. Pardon? Uh, depletes it. So you're using the money to purchase be more. Be if the money. Fed goes into the marketplace and buys securities, what does that do to the money? Uh, increasing. Increasing. Yeah, it's bringing it from the Fed into right. the system. So that's what's open market operates. Open market operation also could mean the Fed buys and sells currencies from time to, from time, to time to uh, impose its will with respect to the marketplace. And then some central banks, as I said, they have a deposit window with excess reserves. They can raise or lower that rate to either encourage parking money with the Fed, um, I should say the central bank, or putting that money for it otherwise. So what happens if the central bank raises the deposit rate, it'll pay its member banks for its excess reserves? What does that do to the money supply? Well, Sorry. yes, it will decrease the money supply because if you could attract banks, I keep looking at her. Your name now? Marissa. 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 Marissa has a bank. Central bank raises the rate that they'll pay for excess reserves. You've got excess reserves. In other words, you've got deposits that you haven't made loans against yet. Marissa, do you sit with those deposits? You've got lights, salaries, mortgage or rent, etc. Uh, benefits, and maybe even you're paying an interest rate if it's a savings account. Do you sit with those deposits, hoping that somebody comes in, or do you place those deposits with the central bank until somebody comes in? Exactly. So if the central bank raises the rate that it'll pay for excess reserves, that's essentially draining reserves out of the system, right? which decreases the money supply. Um, and so the, the last two things we want to cover, last three things we want to cover with respect to what impact exchange rate, government regulation, this is huge. The government can come in and say, today we're doing so-and-so. Today you cannot do so-and-so. This happened in April, this happened on April 5th, 1933, I believe it was. Franklin Delano Roosevelt made it illegal to privately own gold. Government regulation. Uh, in 1963, under President Kennedy, I think it was, uh, the interest equalization tax was introduced. 
So it was designed to discourage Americans and American companies from investing in international markets. Um, then there's purchasing power parity. You're familiar with that, right? Purchasing power parity makes some assumptions, some of them a little bit optimistic, that there's very little to zero tariffs, or that the tariffs are the same in trading nations, in the analysis of two currencies. And what it essentially says is, if, um, Lucas, what's your favorite thing to buy? You collect anything? Uh, yeah, I have uh, jerseys, uh, soccer jerseys. Soccer jerseys, good. If soccer jerseys, during the time when you had, what do you do now? You got the pound, you have the euro. And let's say we're talking about Juventus. You've heard of them, right? Yeah. Italian soccer team. So Juventus jerseys. Suppose they're sold in both the United Kingdom and, and in uh, Italy. But for some reason, they're significantly cheaper in Italy. Purchasing power parity says that currencies will adjust based upon uh, activity of participants based upon purchasing power parity. So purchasing power will come to parity based upon activities they are going to force the currencies to come back into line. So what would happen under purchasing power parity, people like Lucas would rush to buy the jerseys, the Juventus jerseys in Italy, right? Which would, in theory, to buy enough of them is going to raise the euro compared to the pound. Not as good of an example you should be when there was a lira, but you can see the point, right? If you bought enough of them, you're going to have to buy, you're going to pay in euros. So you're going to be selling pounds, just assuming the pound is your own currency, to, to buy euros. So eventually, what would happen is, you do that enough, and guess what? The Juventus journeys won't be, as cheap, won't be cheaper in Italy anymore than in the UK based on purchasing power parity. So it's going to be going to balance things out. So your purchasing power parity uh, essentially says that you should be able, uh, the cost of a good in any country should really be the same when converted by the currency. Now, the thing about it you need to understand is it can take 50 years for this to balance out. It can take a century for it to balance out. But it's not something that will balance out in a week. It's a long-term movement that will cause purchasing power parity to play out in the movement of currencies. But it can be anticipated, and you have to think that some market participants will be speculating that it's going to happen. And then the last thing will be trades executed by a large trader. Nowadays in the market, they refer to them as a whale. That's a huge player that comes to the market and just need to do something. They need to buy and sell a currency. So in the, in the short to medium term, they can impact the market. They can impact the value of an exchange post, be it a uh, dollar yen, a dollar euro, because the volume they need to move is so big that the dealers know, or the dealers get wind of it, and they're going to start to move the quote. So they're going to move the market to get their purchase or sales done. Okay, so, any questions? So, I'm going to go through just one exogenous shot. But there's a whole list of them as you can see. And this is going to show you just what can happen. And hopefully by looking at this, you can determine whether or not, once you sit in the seat of a CFO, an entrepreneur that has foreign exchange exposure, whether you decide to head or not to head. Some people don't head. I, uh, I was at the conference, no, the annual meeting for the Jacksonville Police and Fire Pensions Fund, and they invest in international securities. I asked the question, I said, when you invest in international markets, do you head securities buying now? Uh, Probably stocks, not, not bonds. I asked, did they hedge their exposure? He said, no. And he cited purchasing power parity. I just, no, he didn't cite that in response to my answer, but that consultant stood up and said, no, we don't hedge. So after the, the meeting was uh, over, I, he came to me and said, well, you know, purchasing power parity will bounce these things out. And I said, okay. Fine, he's getting paid, but I'm not getting paid, so that's, that's what he wants to say, it's fine. But purchasing power parity could take a long while. But here's an example. In the year 1324, there was a king in a succession of kings in Mali named Mansur Musa. He was famous for a few things. One of the things he was famous for, in addition to sending uh, 
think it was 200 ships to the Americas in search of a previous expedition to the Americas from uh, the Guinea coast of Africa by uh, Abubakar II, he decided to take pilgrims to Hajj, man of faith. So between 1324 and 1325, he took 76,000 pilgrims to Hajj. That seems to be the, the low number. Um, census number, some people say as many as 80,000 plus. So as he journeyed, most, you know, by land from the west coast of Africa across, went to Egypt, stopped in different places, and then crossed over, went to Hajj, which is in, um, in uh, Mecca, in Saudi Arabia. The medium of exchange that everybody was comfortable with was gold. He had so much gold and used so much gold that he disrupted the economies of the countries he stopped in. Like he imagine, and some of his servants, some of his royal court, they had gold as well. So when they decided that they had any logic, they paid with gold. So he drove down the price of gold in some of those countries, but drove up the price of other things in some of those countries. So this is an example of an exotic in the shop. I mean, was anybody in those countries that came to expect this to happen? The gold would, would, be, would, would be, become so cheap, because he had so much of it. So this is just an example of what can happen in a marketplace where you have multiple players with multiple, almost um, an infinite number of objectives they're trying to achieve. Um, so when you think about going forward in your business or in your role as a professional, as a CFO or something, whether you decide to hedge or not to hedge, think about the fact that things happen. Murphy's Rule comes into play. And uh, if your goal is international trade, international marketing, you have to consider whether the currency aspect of it is a risk that you're willing to assume. So I'm going to go through those. I want to skip to this one. I think we have to start wrapping it up at that time. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about the balance of payments. This is what the balance of payments looks like. The current account. It's a trade account. Merchandise trade services. This is a fundamental analytical tool for some to look at uh, the viability of one currency versus another. In, in trying to wrap up here, I also want you to look at, and you can look at this when you, uh, it's in your presentation. And I'll also make this one, which I actually amended since uh, uh, Dr. Hall provided to you on Friday to include a couple other things. That's in your, that's in your uh, PowerPoint. This shows you how the spot exchange rate is related to the interest rate and how you can take the interest rate. You can take the uh, interest rate and get back to the uh, spot exchange rate, the swap rate. So the swap rate is essentially a calculation of interest differentials, as you can see in the top example. So currencies and interest rates are not two parallel uh, tracks, like a train track. They do intersect all the time, and one impacts the other uh, very significantly. Finally, I want to talk about hedging very briefly. Um, yeah, two minutes. They got other classes. <laughs> hedging is not a silver bullet by any means. When you think of hedging, hedging is merely a substitution of risk, right? And generally what we say when we talk about hedging, we're substituting what's called um, price risk for basis risk. Let me give you a quick example. Using the price of gold. The price of gold is, say, is uh, deliverable at a particular place in New York based upon the COMEX contract, right? So there's a cash price of gold based on London fixing. The basis is the difference between the cash price in a particular location and the, the front month or any given month, any, any given future delivery month in the, in, the, in the gold futures market. So in a hedging situation, uh, let's use current, go back to currencies. If you were expecting to receive yen, which is a cash transaction, there's a yen futures contract. 
So there's a basis, there's a relationship between yen cash and yen futures uh, for any of those given delivery dates, whether it be December, January, February, March, etc. So if, instead of sitting with the exposure that the yen could drop, hedging would mean you would do something to sell the yen in the futures market. So now instead of having an outright exposure to yen, you have exposure to basis, which is much more stable. Basis being cash yen versus the future value of yen trading market exchange or the, the, the currency option value of yen trading on the exchange. So we th when you think about hedging, think about it as substitution of risk, a risk that you're more willing to accept. Basis risk is very, basis of generally very stable, whereas the outright price of a commodity or currency can fluctuate dramatically. You can have 10%, 20% moves uh, sometimes in a month, and that'll probably wipe out the most profits from any international trade transactions. So I want to thank you for having me today. And if you have any questions, I'm sure Dr. Hall can get us together for a follow-up or I'll also provide to you. I'll provide to him because I did a presentation of a couple more items. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Mm, all right, you guys.